with you. Uh, we would like to thank uh, Mayor Ted Wheeler in the city of Portland and everyone who contributed to the I Choose Love uh, community challenge today. At a time like this, Portland is in need, deep need of something to bring us together. And I'm happy to be a part of something that can capitalize on doing that. Um, our mission today in the I Choose Love USA Foundation is collaborating with first responders, city officials, and community members to create a blueprint for building back trust and respect in the city of Portland through transformative healing, choice of love, foundation to a safer, more equitable community that will ultimately heal our nation. The gift of love is endowed with unifying power, the strength to look beyond our differences, to see the beauty in each of us. I choose love as a conscious choice and a shared responsibility. We choose love because it has the power to unify people of all walks of life. It possesses the power to elevate goodwill and kindness towards all of its transformative power and create a lasting, meaningful, meaningful and permanent change. Dr. Ray Leary, it can, be, it can be said that life has a service of well-lived. When we look back on the moments of history, we see the truth in the lives of Mother Teresa, Gandhi, Nelson Mandela, and MLK. In 1972, Ray Leary was a co-captain of Jefferson High School State Championship basketball team. 33 years later, his trajectory from sports superstar to Portland area developer, track Portland area developer is responsible for Northeast Portland's Vanport Square. He was nominated by the city of Portland as a representative of the Regional Metro Commission overseeing the Oregon Convention Center, Portland Expo Center, and Portland Center for the Performing Arts. It is my honor to introduce the man of service in his family, community, Oregon, and the world. With an open heart, minds, please, please join me in welcoming our voluntary speaker, Ray Leary. At this point in time, Ray is here. He's not going to join us, <laughs> but thank you, Ray. Uh, at this moment in time, I'd like to welcome the Brown Sisters, who are considered one of the best vocal groups to come out of Portland. You know, they are born and raised in the city of Portland and have been singing gospel and inspirational mu music for over 30 years. Their talent, love, and passion for music has allowed them the opportunity to open for the late Dr. Maya Angelou. And they have shared the platform with well-known artists such as C.C. Winans, the Oregon Symphony, and the Portland Trailblazers. You don't listen to the Brown Sisters just with your ears. You listen with your heart and your soul. They composed the lyrics to the I Choose Love anthem. And now is it our pleasure to introduce to you the Brown Sisters. Yeah. Oh. Love covers, love heals, love is God revealed. Love is gentle, love is kind, love wins every time. Love is more than an emotion. emotion. It's a choice, the only solution to change the world, choose love. It don't always feel good, it don't always look right, but I choose love. Yay, follow me as I follow Christ. Yeah, follow me, follow, follow me. Follow me, follow. Love is patient, unconditional, so meek and very humble. Unfailing the high road that leads to life, you'll never stumble. Love is more than an emotion. emotion. It's a choice, the only solution to change the world. Choose love, yeah. It don't always feel good, oh. it don't always feel good, but I choose love. Choose love. I choose oh. love. It don't always 
That was beautiful, that was beautiful. And at this moment in time, it is a great honor of mine to introduce the mayor of Portland, Mayor Ted Wheeler. Well, thank you everyone. And first of all, thank you, uh, Mr. Harrison for being our MC this morning. And Dr. Leary, thank you for being here today and gracing us with your presence and your inspirational leadership. And can we please uh, give another round of applause and show some love for the Brown sisters in their song, Choose Love. That was just remarkable. Thank you so much for being here. So today we're here with a simple message. We're here to choose love and to continue the work that we're doing together to overcome the immense challenges that we are experiencing in our city so that we can best take care of our family, our friends, in the city of Portland that we love so much. Today, we remember how important a simple message is. Choose love. As your mayor, I'll tell you that Portland embraces and celebrates love in so many different ways. For example, just recently, community members have volunteered by the thousands 
to donate resources, to stabilize our community, to connect people in need with food, with water, with COVID-19 tests and vaccines. Literally thousands of community members came together to help clean up litter and abate graffiti. So many people by the thousands came forward to support our local businesses, our essential workers, our artists, our musicians, and so many others as they adapted to keep us nourished, to keep us inspired, and to keep us entertained during some really difficult times. These actions, I believe, embody our city's core values to help our community overcome its challenges. These are actions that I'm confident sow the seeds of a better tomorrow. These are the values and the actions to aspire to, to support and to talk about. So my message today is join us. Hate and hate groups have no place in our city. Violence has no place in our city. Bigotry has no place in our city. Racism must be etched out of the fabric of our community, our state, and our nation. I know, and I can say confidently, that I speak for all Portlanders when I say that we will not tolerate acts of violence, destruction, prejudice, or intimidation. These acts are inherently vain and selfish, and they take away from critical resources that those in need need in order to gain access to life-saving relief programs and services that they desperately need at this time. We should be proud of the progress that we've made as a city already. Yes, we still have a lot of work to do together. Nobody can deny that reality, but we must believe that tomorrow will be better. We must continue to foster a culture here in our community that embraces innovation, creativity, diversity, and empathy. We must support a culture that challenges the status quo to build the city of the future that we want to see collectively. We must believe that our city needs to change, and we must also believe that that change is possible. And we must always remember what at our core drives us together, and that is a sense of love. The love of our family, our friends, and our community. That's who we are, and that's what we're here today to celebrate. Choose love. Thank you, and it's now my privilege to introduce my friend, Metro President Lynn Peterson. Good morning, Lynn. Good morning, and thank you so much, Mayor. Uh, to be honest, I hold out <clears throat> little hope that any Proud Boys are going to listen to the Metro Council President when she says, we don't want you here. And I don't think many counter-protesters will be surprised to hear the Metro Council President say, don't take their bait. But I hope that all those thinking about fighting in our community this weekend see the strength, unity, diversity, love, empathy, and genuine care for the people in our community on display here today. I hope enough of our words make it through. And I want to urge everyone to visit handsonportland.org to learn about volunteer opportunities in our region. We all have a limited amount of energy. So now more than ever, we need people to channel that positive energy. So please visit the United Way's website at handsonportland.org to see what you can do to help the people in this region. It might feel good to yell and taunt or to chase a bunch of pathetic boys around downtown Portland. You might feel like you are an element of justice when our society and our system have let you down. But this has been going on for more than two years. And violence doesn't make anyone feel safer. So please take your energy, your time, and volunteer in your community, our community. That's where your region needs you this week and every week. Choose love. Thank you, Mayor. Good morning, everyone. 
Um, if it wasn't a good morning before, it certainly feels better now, thanks to that incredible performance from the Brown sisters. That was amazing. Thank you. I'm Deborah Kafori. I'm your Multnomah County Chair. And I know that it's nothing new to say that we together have endured what feels like a lifetime's worth of urgent crises over the last 18 months. It's been traumatic and it's been tiring, but it's also been clarifying because for as much as things have felt out of our control for these last 18 months, we've also seen that holding and committing to things that we can control, to the things that we can choose, can make a meaningful difference. And I think that's what makes the song that the Brown sisters sang resonate so deeply. There is no way to force a group of people who subscribe to the ideologies of white nationalism and white supremacy from descending on our community this weekend. That is, unfortunately, another thing that's out of our control. But we're here today to stand firm and communicate clearly the values that our community aspires to and the vision that we are choosing to work toward. The pandemic revealed the countless inequities and injustices that have plagued our community for decades, themselves rooted in systems of oppression that have plagued and defined our country for generations. Our community has the opportunity to come together in the belief that we are capable of being better. And the way that we recover from this deeply challenging chapter in our history isn't to go back to what was, but rather to build a more equitable and a more just community. And the way that we create positive lasting change is to listen and be led by those who have often been and sometimes still are spoken over. It requires the tough work of being honest about our organizations and institutions and, and the even tougher work of genuinely changing the way they operate. And that includes the organization that I'm in charge of. Is appreciating a truthful accounting of our past enough to properly recognize its legacies of harm and to value our shared present and future enough to know that we all can help interrupt those legacies. That process can be awkward and transformative, painful and healing, tense and empowering all at the same time. But a more equitable, inclusive, hopeful future is what we will have, what we have chosen to pursue in our present, because we know that it is without a doubt worth, worthwhile and right. The groups that are planning to travel to our city this weekend are threatened by this vision and a community that has chosen to try and achieve it. So they resort to displays of intimidation and threats of violence. And we've seen this play out enough times to know that they have every intention of picking fights. And to do so this weekend would be to engage in this provocation in the middle of a covert surge with our hospitals at capacity. And while there's always room for disagreement, we recognize that just because these ideolo ideologues stand in opposition to equity, justice and inclusion, their ideas absolutely do not stand on equal ground. White nationalism and white supremacy are not welcome here. Not this weekend, not ever. And I stand firmly with the community to denounce these ideologies of hate, exclusion and bigotry. Our community chooses to embrace compassion, to open wide the circle of who and what our community looks like and to continue to build something better. We choose to stand together. Thank you. And now I'd like to pass it off to our district attorney, Mike Schmidt. Thank you, Chair Kafori. I'm struck with gratitude today seeing so many members of the community stand in solidarity to rise above hate and violence. Thank you. We're here today because we understand that there's going to be an event this Sunday that may lead to hate and violence. I continue to condemn those things. It has no legitimate purpose. The right, the duty even, to peacefully protest and say what you believe in is undermined by those acts. In my role as Multnomah County District Attorney, I interface with victims of hate and violence every day. In my office, we advocate for justice, not by asking what's the longest sentence we can get, 
But by asking what is best for the victim, what will reduce the chances of the defendant committing the crime again? And what's best for the community? As I was contemplating this conversation, I wondered what it would look like if we applied these principles to the people we disagree with, repairing the hurt, finding pathways to growth, so we don't repeat the same mistakes again and fostering better outcomes in our communities. We know that people across the ideological spectrum feel frustrated and disenfranchised. It's an uncomfortable truth. We know that those experiences can lead to movements for reform, like the movement for Black Lives. But they can also lead to radicalization, violence, and distrust in our systems. Look at what happened in our nation's capital on January 6th of this year. The latter often brings people to my doorstep as district attorney. And we also know, or I believe we have the ability to learn that when we seek resolution over violence, accountability over vengeance, and most importantly, recognize one another's humanity over opinions, we move away from more victimization and disenfranchisement. And to me, that sounds a lot like choosing love. We've even seen the death in our community from events like this, like the one scheduled on Sunday, two last year, in fact, one associated with Patriot Prayer and the other Antifa. These homicides are the antithesis of why we must approach conflict differently. This is not a game. Our community has been through a lot together before and since. We must continue to rise to the occasion and prevent anything like this from happening again. We're in a pivotal time right now. We cannot afford to allow the progress we've made to be overshadowed by violence and hate. And I'm asking those who may choose to participate in Sunday's event to consider these words of caution. They're also words of hope. Once more, thanks again to all attending today's event and for those that share these values who are at work today, caring for a loved one or in a classroom. Thank you. Good morning. Let's see if this switches. Good morning. I'm Eric Ward, Executive Director of Western State Center. One year ago, despite several years of intimidation, when white nationalists and anti government ideologues invaded Portland streets, some people may have still been surprised. Now, 12 months later, after the attack on the Oregon Capitol, the violent insurrection in our nation's capital on January 6, and a string of anti-democratic violence across Oregon this summer, there is absolutely no longer any excuse for being caught unawares. We know what the Proud Boys and other paramilitary formations coming to Portland this weekend are looking to do. Sunday's rally is an intentional effort to undermine Portland's civil society and to intimidate its communities. Bigoted and anti-democratic groups want to sow chaos to promote their dangerous and exclusionary agenda as an alternative to local government. These groups know they stand to benefit from a perception of lawlessness and fear. So that's exactly what they intend to spread this weekend. Violence at these events isn't a bug, it's a feature. But those of us who care about democracy, who love Portland and reject hate, aren't powerlessness, powerless, just the opposite. When elected officials, nonprofit institutions, faith leaders, the business community, and ordinary citizens join together to make clear that they reject white nationalism, and reject efforts to undermine Portland civil society, we begin the important process that closes the door to political violence and stops anti-democratic extremists from mainstreaming their tactics and agenda nationally. Whether here with us today or at other events, I'm proud of the broad coalition of leaders and community members who raise their voices today but I'm also dismayed by those who will be missing from these diverse responses. The burden of responding to political violence cannot be limited to a handful of leaders. It cannot be limited to Portland, Multnomah County, the Metro itself. 
city and county officials from communities surrounding the metro area need to take responsibility for countering paramilitary and authoritarian violence. These voices are noticeably absent this week. It shouldn't need to be said in 2021, but yet here we are. Portland isn't an island. The demonstrations of white nationalism we'll see on Sunday are part of a broader anti-democratic assault that requires support from the federal government and a response from all levels of state and local leadership in Oregon. We know based on prior far-right mobilizations in Portland that the majority of attendees do not reside here, but travel to the city to engage in political violence. This will be the case again on Sunday. Attacks on democratic institutions haven't stayed within the Portland city limits, and neither can our response. Let's be clear, under the best conditions, no city in the United States could successfully meet the challenges posed by white nationalism by itself. It's time to acknowledge this. And more importantly, it's time for the federal government and state government and surrounding municipal and county governments to acknowledge it too. It's time for a state and federal rapid response just not the kind we've seen in the past. This can no longer be relegated to merely another discussion about law enforcement and criminal activity. This is about developing a larger set of initiatives to prevent in an attempt to undermine local democracy. It's about being part of a state and country that seeks not only to exist peacefully, but to thrive in an abundance of opportunity. This can't be about Portland versus the rest of Oregon. It can't be about cities versus the suburbs and rural areas. It can't be about Democrat versus Republican or progressives versus conservatives. This is about those of us who love democracy versus those who would tear it down and use violence to push their dangerous and bigoted agendas. Our state and our nation not just our city, are facing an existential threat aimed at the heart of democracy. It's time for us to act like it. It's time that we together act as urgently as this crisis requires. We can reject the politics of fear and division and build something much stronger, more inclusive, and more lasting. Now I'd like to invite Amy Spittlenet. Amy joins us with over a decade of experience in government politics and advocacy. She was the communications director and senior policy advisor to New York Attorney General Barbara Underwood. She also previously served as an advisor and spokesperson for New York City's Mayor de Blasio and a communications director in the New York Senate. Amy has worked with a number of federal, state, and local campaigns and advocacy organizations, so much so that in 2013, she was named city and state under 40, 40 rising stars. Amy is currently the executive director of Integrity First for America, a nonpartisan, nonprofit organization dedicated to holding those accountable who threaten longstanding principles of democracy including our country's commitment to civil rights and equal justice. Most notably, Amy and Integrity First for America is the organization supporting Charlottesville's community members in their lawsuit against Nazis and white supremacists responsible for the violence there four years ago. We are honored to have her. And Amy, thank you for joining us today. Thank you so much, Eric, uh, who, can you all hear me? Thank you so much, Eric, who has just be, been uh, a tireless partner and friend in this work. And I am so grateful to be with all of you here today. 
Look, I think in moments like this, it's easy for communities to feel powerless, to feel hopeless, to feel alone. But as Eric described, Portland is not alone. What's playing out on Portland's streets um, really reflect how it's become a battleground in a national crisis, a crisis that we're seeing manifest in a variety of ways in communities across this country. Now, that doesn't mean that Portland isn't targeted for a specific reason. Much like Charlottesville, Berkeley, and so many other communities, Portland has become a target of these extremists because the community represents everything these extremists abhor. And these extremists seek to take us backwards, exploiting a dark history and the systems of white supremacy in an attempt to do nothing less than undercut the type of inclusive democracy many are fighting for, including many here today. We know this story, though. We saw it in Charlottesville four years ago when extremists descended on the city. They came under the guise of defending this country's dark history of bigotry at a time when many were finally reckoning with it and fighting for change and progress. But as we now know, and as my organization's lawsuit details, the purpose of that weekend was even more vile. Much like those who have been terrorizing Portland, these neo-Nazis and white supremacists came to Charlottesville with a clear goal racist violence. And of course, racist violence is what followed. And so at Integrity First for America, we're holding these extremists accountable in court with a federal lawsuit that goes to trial in just two months. And much like with the violence in Portland, it's clear that the attack on Charlottesville wasn't an isolated incident, but rather a preview of what's followed in our communities and in our country. The statistics really bear this out in horrific ways. Hate crimes hit their highest ever levels in 2019, according to the FBI. Anti-Semitic incidents, anti-Asian hate, and so many other forms of extremism have also hit record levels. Domestic terror has been on the rise. 2019 was the deadliest year for domestic terror in the U.S. since 1995, which was the year of the Oklahoma City bombing. And according to both governmental and non-governmental statistics, nearly all extremist-related murders were committed by right-wing extremists. And last year, the Department of Homeland Security stated clearly white supremacy is the most pervasive and lethal threat to our country. The stats paint a terrifying picture. Anecdotally, we also know this to be true. Each attack, each incident of violence inspires the next one. The Charlottesville leaders communicated with the Pittsburgh shooter before his attack on the Tree of Life congregation. The white supremacist who murdered dozens of Muslims in Christ Church two years ago donated to two of the Charlottesville leaders and um, painted onto his gun a white power symbol that had been popularized by another white supremacist leader in Charlottesville. He live streamed his attack on Facebook and in turn inspired the Poe and El Paso attacks. Of course, the ways in which the Capitol insurrection followed the Charlottesville playbook are just too numerous to talk about here. But it's not just these big headline grabbing attacks. It's also the steady drumbeat of terror that communities like Portland are facing from these demonstrations on a too regular basis, where that very terror and violence is used to inspire the next act of terror or violence. It's the record level hate crimes targeting people in cities around this country. It's the extremism that is becoming increasingly mainstream and manifesting in so many ways. And so while the exact details of how this extremism plays out in Portland may be unique, Portland's not alone. And what we see happening on Portland streets really are a manifestation of a national crisis and illustrate what's at stake for all of us. Even before this weekend's planned events, this week has already brought a stark reminder of the crisis of extremism in this country. Just yesterday, a far-right extremist threatened to detonate a bomb on Capitol Hill, seemingly radicalized by the same disinformation and conspiracies that's fueled so much violence in recent years. At the same time, we see extremists exploit the crisis in Afghanistan using the same sort of far-right, xenophobic, racist, and anti-democratic conspiracy theories, um, again, that have fueled so much hate and violence. I want to be clear that none of this is an accident. These violent extremists are not simply lone wolves. Rather, this violence and extremism is the inevitable result of years of anti-democratic forces who are uniquely emboldened and empowered in this moment, who seek to seize on any progress we're making towards a more inclusive society and democracy. And even though their core ideas are rooted in age-old bigotry, they're repackaged and elevated in new ways, supported by an online ecosystem that's allowing for hate and conspiracies and disinformation to metastasize at unprecedented rates, helping drive extremists out onto our streets like we're seeing in Portland. So what can we do about this? 
First and foremost, we know that accountability matters. That's our focus at Integrity First for America. We're using our justice system to hold accountable those responsible for the attack in Charlottesville four years ago. And you know, for me, this is particularly meaningful. I'm the granddaughter of Holocaust survivors. And as we see extremists take to the streets to spread their hate-fueled violence, it's easy to draw parallels to those dark times in our history. But I also know there's a big difference, that unlike my grandparents' generation, we live in a country that has a justice system and a rule of law, and that they are supposed to work for us. We have to fight like crazy to protect that rule of law, to ensure our justice system actually works fairly and equitably for everyone. At a time when accountability has been in such short supply, we must use the tools we have to ensure that sort of accountability, to reform and protect our system so that it actually works for everyone. It can't just fall to individual citizens like the brave plaintiffs in our Charlottesville case and people like you who are, of course, coming out today to stand up against hate. It requires coordinated action from all levels of government, federal, state, and local, to treat this crisis with the urgency it deserves. As Eric said, Portland isn't an island, and resolution requires its neighbors to take responsibility too. And of course, it requires a national approach to counter this national threat. It also requires us to be clear-eyed about this threat, not creating false equivalencies between different sides, understanding what motivates this hate. These extremists seek to sow divisions between communities because our fates are deeply intertwined. As Eric explains better than anyone, frankly, it's impossible to take on white nationalism and racism without taking on anti-Semitism or Islamophobia, xenophobia, homophobia, misogyny, and all other forms of hate. And similarly, we can't take on that hate without taking on the white nationalism and white supremacy at their core. Our fates are interconnected. It's all the more crucial that we recognize this at a time when extremism is increasingly seeping into the mainstream, with pundits and officials and outlets in certain cases granting it explicit support and a megaphone, given license to the sort of violent hate and extremism Portland is bracing for yet again. We need to use the tools we have to send a clear message that this violence, that this extremism has no place in our community, that we must hold those responsible accountable, and that to choose love also means choosing inclusivity, democracy, and justice. There are so many more of us than there are of them. We see it here today, but we need to be clear-eyed about the threat. We need to ensure that there's real accountability after so many years of so little. We must keep working toward the very type of inclusive democracy these extremists seek to undermine. That is how we break the cycle. Thank you so much for having me today. It's such an honor to join all of you. And it's my privilege to now introduce Andrew Hone of the Portland Business Alliance. Thank you so much, Amy. It's always hard to follow such thoughtful um, remarks that really center ourselves and allow all of us to reflect in a, in a deeper fashion. And of course, always hard to follow a, a New Yorker. So um, thank you so much for joining us today. And of course, thank you to our mayor, all the colleagues who are speaking today, to the Brown sisters for making my day with that music, and to the incredible voices of diversity who are speaking up today, and our public officials who deserve our thanks for their service to our community. And thank you to everybody who showed up today in support of our message and our Portland community. This weekend, we will be visited, as we are annually around this time, by hate groups that have been intent and continue to be intent on sowing division and we cannot control that, but we can control how we respond. And I'm here and represent 2000 plus member businesses across the seven counties and beyond, but many right here in the downtown core where I'm speaking from today. Violence, hate, and racism unequivocally damage our community at a time when our region continues to struggle to recover from a marathon of crises and prevent Portlanders from accessing their jobs and for businesses to thrive. Hatred and violence are not just a business issue or a labor issue or a government job or a nonprofit job to respond to. It is a human issue and a human response. And we are responding today as one community and filled with the admiration of our place in our home and with love for one another. The business community chooses love. And this is the Portland way, to collaborate to tackle our most pressing challenges as a community together. Hatred is not welcome in our home, 
And we ask all Portlanders to counter hatred with the love of this great city and region and commit to the harder work of creating a better and a more equitable region from the backdrop of so many crises over this past year. It is not the act of one day that will define us, but how we show up 365 days a year to build a better future. Thank you for having me, and I am happy to introduce Neil Lee from the Chinese Consolidated Benevolent Association. Thank you, Neil. Uh, thank you, Andrew, um, and good afternoon, everyone. My name is Neil Lee. I am the president of the Chinese Consolidated Benevolent Association, or better known locally as the CCBA. I want to thank you for taking the time to attend this virtual gathering and supporting the message from our elected officials and community leaders to condemn acts of violence and discrimination in Portland, Oregon, and beyond to advocate, to work together peacefully, to obtain racial justice, building an effective policing community, and to stamp out COVID-19 as quickly as possible. Portland CCBA is a traditional Chinese association that was established in 1911 to operate and interface with local government to represent and support the Chinese community during the Chinese Exclusion Act era, the first and only federally approved legislation to deny immigration of an entire race and strip us of basic rights and privileges enjoyed by everyone else. I hope that will never happen again. Since the beginning of the pandemic, the world has endured incredible loss of life from COVID-19, economic trauma, extreme climate events, exploding crime rates, political division, and open race discrimination. Last year at this time, we had a clash of organized activists from the far right and left, inadvertently putting Portland in the international spotlight, a flashpoint in civil unrest in the United States and world at large. This spring of this year, with a wave of hate and violence directed at the Asian community, an idea was brought forth to utilize the CCBA's unused billboard in the center of Old Town Chinatown to send a message to the general public. To that end, the CCBA was support of several committees, individuals, organizations, locally, nationally, and abroad. We were able to install on this billboard, a large and clear message for all. Rise against hate. No matter what race, ethnicity, religion, or orientation, right wing, left wing, Democrat, Republican, we must stop fighting with each other and aspire peacefully, collaborate with each other instead. Let's spread some love. Let's look at the bigger picture. Let's work together and save our planet. Our existence depends on it. Thank you. And now I would like to pass the baton to Nancy Hawk from Basic Rights Oregon. Thank you. Good morning. Thank you, Neil. Thank you, Mayor Wheeler, for having me here today. My name is Nancy Hawk, and I'm the Executive Director of Basic Rights Oregon. We're the state's leading policy and advocacy organization for LGBTQ Oregonians. And when I think about choosing love, I think about the strength and resilience of LGBTQ people in our state. We have endured over 30 ballot measures against us, questioning our right to exist, our right to love who we love, our right to live free from discrimination, not to mention the physical attacks, violence, murders, and fire bombings that our community has faced. So when I hear about the Proud Boys coming to town, I think about yet another attack on our community because they don't just come to town and rally. They drive around Interstate Avenue in the Lloyd District looking for trans and gender nonconforming people to attack. They follow and intimidate Black Lives Matters activists on a daily basis. 
their hatred isn't just on the occasional weekend. And what we need to do is look at the systems that are creating the Proud Boys and allowing them to flourish. And every time they come to town, what we need to do as a city is say, we are against racism, homophobia, transphobia, Islamophobia, misogyny, and fascism. We stand against those beliefs and we will protect our citizens from those who have those beliefs. But that's not what we are experiencing because what I hear over and over from the community is that they do not feel protected by the police. Far from it. Over and over, the police have shown that they don't protect the community from these far-right extremists. And it's not just a Portland problem. The whole country saw it on January 6th when the far-right took over the U.S. Capitol. We need to change the systems that are allowing this to happen. And as LGBTQ people, we know what it's like to fight for systemic change. We know what it's like to fight for our rights. We know what it's like to have to ask other people to see our humanity enough to recognize our relationships and our genders as real and valid and worthy. And we live in a time where we're reminded daily of the ways that justice is not being served to black and brown communities. So it's my hope that the lesson learned from our history is that we never doubt our power to make change, that we never doubt that we are stronger together, and that we never doubt that our love is stronger than their hate. Thank you, and I am pleased to introduce my friend from the labor movement, Graham Trainer. Thanks so much, Nancy, and thank you to Mayor Wheeler and leaders for bringing us together today. And I'd also just like to share my gratitude for the voices and the leadership that we've heard from this morning. What an inspiring group. Um, my name is Graham Trainer. My pronouns are he, him, and I'm proud to serve as president of the Oregon AFL-CIO, the statewide federation of labor unions and a voice for all working Oregonians. From the dramatic, disproportionately felt impacts of COVID-19 to back-to-back -back historic wildfire seasons, to unprecedented heat waves, to the rise in violence, extremism, and white nationalism, and white supremacy in our streets. This has been a momentous and incredibly challenging time for working Oregonians and Portlanders, to put it mildly. And this collective trauma has really forced us and enabled us to all think about the kind of city and state that we can be, what we should be, and more bluntly, what we must be. Working people make this city run, help this city recover from crisis serve our most vulnerable and marginalized community members and truly are the backbone of our city. So when I think about the city that we must be, it's a city that celebrates, respects, and protects its workers, where we understand that one of the greatest tools for combating discrimination, harassment, and inequities in the economy is through a union contract, and where the intersectionality between the fights against extremism, hatred, and bigotry, and the fight for economic justice for all that it's just a given. So I'm proud to be a part of a labor movement here in Oregon and in Portland that is actively working to dismantle systems of oppression, actively tackling barriers that unfairly target community members of color, and that is consistently and increasingly taking a firm unwavering stand against white nationalism, white supremacy, extremism, and hate. Now we have so much work to do, of course, but the labor movement has a critical role to play in this fight. So as we renew our commitment to this work, we must also, and it's been mentioned before, center those in our community and in our organizations who are all too often targeted by these extremist groups, made to feel less than, made to feel unsafe, black, indigenous people of color, who are disproportionately targets of this violence and discrimination. We must listen to, learn from, and take the lead of leaders and organizations working in the most impacted communities. Again, this is a must. So for Portland to live up to all our city can be, should be, and must be, of course, it will take all of us. And the Oregon Labor Movement stands ready to be a partner, a collaborator, and a co-conspirator in this ongoing work, the work of rebuilding, of revitalizing, of, and of recommitting ourselves to the vision of a safer, more inclusive, and more resilient city and the work to defend our shared values this coming weekend in the weeks, months, and years ahead. Now, it's my privilege to turn it back over to Mayor Ted Wheeler.
Well, thank you. I want to thank each and every one of you for joining us today for this important event. And I want to thank each of our speakers. You are all so incredibly inspirational. I also want to thank the amazing crew here at the Alberta Street Pub. Red, thank you to you and your crew for uh, giving us a great location for some of us here this morning. I certainly want to thank Music Portland for their hosting us as well. Our beloved cultural institutions and venues, our musicians and our artists, they've continued to inspire us, bring us laughs and smiles, and help us find some grounding during a really difficult time for our city. They've also, perhaps more importantly than anything, they've connected us. And even though we know we're not quite out of the woods yet, we know we still have some tough struggles ahead, it's so important that this community stay together. So let's continue to support not only our artists, our musicians, our venues, our first responders, the people who work in healthcare, the people who work in the local grocery stores, our supply chain experts, the drivers, everybody who has done so much to get us through to this point. Thank you. Thank you, Portland for choosing love. And with that, I'll turn it over to Mr. Harrison to close us out. Thank you, Mayor. Before I hand it over to the Brown Sisters for the finale uh, song, I'd like to say a few words. The beautiful thing about I choose love is that the choose in it is a verb. You know, every day you get up, and you get out and you get to choose what you want to do. It's an action, right? You get to choose to love your wife, choose to love your husband, choose to love your neighbor. It's, it's all on you and it starts with us. It starts with me, it starts with you, and it leads to a bigger future. I think Hollywood has kind of facaded love as an emotion and not a verb. They think it's something that we feel when the real reality is something that we, we choose. We, we choose to love. And in the city of Portland, I think we all want to become proactive people instead of reactive people. You know, we have 86,400 seconds in a day. And sometimes somebody could, you know, get us off our rocker or say something we don't like or do something we don't like. And sometimes we let it affect our whole day. I think from this day forward, we should work on not letting those 10 seconds ruin the rest of our 86,400 minutes in the day or seconds of the day. So with that being said, I'd like to end this with the Brown sisters singing a last song, a rendition, a reprise of I Choose Love. And with that, here they are. For I, you know, the sign language I see for choose and then love. One, two, here we go. I choose love. Yay, it's the best choice to choose. I choose love. It makes all the difference in the world. I choose, I choose love. It's healing. It's so wonderful. I choose love. It drives out hatred. Yeah. I choose love. When I'm driving down the street, when I'm walking down the road. I choose love. When I'm in my neighborhood, when I'm on my job. I choose love. I choose you. You're important to me. Choose love. It brings justice and equality. I choose love. Every day, every moment. I choose love. Come on, sing it a little bit louder. I choose love. One more time, Portland. Let's choose love. I choose love.